Hello and welcome to another Out of Spec Reviews video. You join me with the Lucid Air Grand Touring for what I believe to be the most important video we'll shoot with this car. Uh, it's no secret that driving is my passion and you guys for watching our videos allow me to drive some amazing cars. And I wanna say a huge thank you to our viewer, Peter, who loaned us this Lucid Air. Um, very rarely do we have to go through viewers to get some of the newest electric cars on the market, but we asked Lucid for one for a long time and honestly, we didn't have an opportunity to really spend a lot of time driving it. So Peter said, hey, everyone wants you to review this car. Let me send you mine for pretty much a month. What a nice guy. And so we're actually reaching towards the end of our reviews with this car. And that's usually when I do the driving stuff, when I've really spent the time to figure out the intricacies, how the car performs in different environments. And then I make a really long in-depth nerd level 9,000 video for you guys explaining how this drives, not only in the city, inching around all the low speed, the regen controls, we go on the highway, we cruise for a long distance talking about its driver assistance systems or lack thereof in this case, because it still hasn't received the newest software update, even though others are getting it. A little bit weird. We'll talk about that throughout the review. And most importantly to me, we're gonna take it up into the canyons and see how agile this car is and see if it can really be fun to drive. So as always, we're first gonna start by walking you around the exterior, telling you how the car's laid out, all the specs, the numbers, all that stuff. Then we'll jump in, drive around the city, and go through the rest of everything. I wanna say a huge thank you to Sparrow World for sponsoring today's video. Hey, these guys are doing something pretty incredible. They are supporting our forgotten Afghan allies through this wonderful charity, which you can find on freedomraffle.org. All you have to do is purchase a $150 ticket and you're immediately entered to win a Tesla Model S Plaid. Guess what? Sparrow World already has the Plaid, so as soon as you win the raffle, it shouldn't take long for you to get the car. On top of that, you have the best chances ever that I've seen of winning one of these cars in the raffles that we've done here. And that's because Sparrow World has only sold about 20% of their tickets coming up to their deadline. So all you have to do is head to freedomraffle.org to support our forgotten Afghan allies by purchasing some tickets. And of course you're entered to win that awesome Model S Plaid. Best of luck and thank you to Sparrow Worldwide for sponsoring today's video. To start, let's talk drivetrain. Lucid uses permanent magnet motors, and um, this has two of them. This is an all-wheel drive variant. There's been four variants on sale of Lucid Air up to this point. They had the two launch specs, which were called Dream Editions. They had a Dream Edition Performance and a Dream Edition Range. That had a 118 kilowatt hour usable battery pack. Um, this has the same battery pack as that car in terms of construction and layout, but a slightly different chemistry that only allows for a maximum of 112 kilowatt hours claimed. I've been able to pull 109 out of it. Um, in terms of powertrain, this is the Grand Touring non-performance. So the Dream Performance, the Dream Range, that was 520 miles of EPA range, and I think 1,111 horsepower. You could choose between the two. Couldn't get them both at the same time. You, you can get big range with big power with electric motors though. And then with Grand Touring, you have this one, and then you also have a performance variant of Grand Touring. So this makes 818, 819 horsepower. The performance one, yeah, up in that 1,000 horsepower range. There will also be a Sapphire version coming later, which will be a quarter million dollars, uh, wide body, carbon brakes. That'll be kind of fun to play around with. Uh, and then there'll also be a rear wheel drive pure version that will have a little bit smaller battery pack. And uh, then there's also a touring. So you can go on the website and see all the different specs, but this one is the big range version you can buy on sale today. It's 516 miles of EPA range when you're on the 19 inch wheels. You'll see we're on the 21s. So I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but overall, this is the range spec. Dream editions you can't buy anymore, so it's not even worth quoting those figures at this point. Um, You'll notice the car's on 21 inch wheels and tires. I made a whole video about that, but Lucid sent these out to us. They saw that we were testing a viewer's car uh, and a huge thanks to Peter, a viewer for loaning us this car again. Just what a nice guy to let us drive it for a month. Um, Lucid, you know, was like, oh, are you doing driving stuff? And I'm like, yeah, these 19s have not much traction. They're like, we'll send you a set of 21s out there. Um, so, you know, a little bit of support from Lucid. Want to say thank you. Uh, for them to sending out the wheels, but those of course will will go back and um, really they're on here just for our canyon portion, which will come at the later 
end of this video. In terms of drivetrain, we have a 178 kilowatt electric motor on the front axle, permanent magnet motor, so what's that, 250 horsepower almost, on the front axle. On the rear axle, we have a 433 kilowatt electric motor, pretty spicy, and um, yeah, both permanent magnet motors. So we should get a pretty big hit off the line when we use the built-in launch control function. Uh, I wanna talk about chassis setup really quickly. This car is built on Leap, Lucid Electric uh, something platform, advanced platform, I think. Uh, anyway, it's a fully bespoke, ground up, new chassis, new everything, and they really spent the time benchmarking some other cars is my understanding things as agile as porsche Taycan, all the way up to the comfort of a mercedes s-class there's always compromises when you're engineering a vehicle but the idea here was max reins max comfort and then make the car as agile as possible which is something i can really appreciate and i'm looking forward to seeing how it does in the canyons couple interesting bits going on up here. The Lucid Air has no air suspension. It's a totally passive air suspension, except for an active damper. Um, I don't know if they're using the DT Sky damper or which one, but it has a res uh, reservoir that's off-board mounted, which is pretty cool. So a remote reservoir damper with um, solenoid actuated damping force control, which is pretty standard, but like pretty cool that's got a remote reservoir. They do all the software tuning logic in-house to control the damper. So the damper is obviously from a supplier, but then Lucid does their own software control of that. And just my impression of how well it can control the body movements without an air component is really impressive. It's probably the widest range of adjustability that I've seen from a non-air car. So I think that's neat. One thing I wish it did have though was of course air suspension because I'd want to slam this thing to the ground when I park it because it would look so much better than having this massive wheel gap here, at least for styling. Um, the tire selection is very interesting as well because you need to balance that compromise between range and efficiency and noise versus outright performance. So on the 19 inch wheels, they're 245 section tires front and rear. Here we have a 245 section front tire and a 265 section rear tire. Really not that wide. Just for reference, the Model S dual motor long range has a 285 section rear tire when you talk about the aero wheels. So not much tire on this car. Um, and I'd be really curious to see how the grip levels are. The, the 19 inch wheel is a square setup. This is a staggered. So the handling dynamics should change depending on what wheel setup you choose from Lucid. Overall grip levels will be higher here. The tire that we're running on for this review is a Pirelli. Let's see. Um, what tire did they put on here? A P0 with, it's an electric specific tire with the noise insulation foam and it is a Lucid OE specification tire. I also broke the tires in. I got a couple heat cycles into them before the review. So, you know, a few hundred miles of driving, scrubbed all the stuff off of them. So we should be broken in uh, for the tire review. In terms of suspension, pretty interesting. They use not really traditional upper or lower control arms here. It's a four diagonal link suspension, which creates almost a virtual steering rack, if you will. Um, the way it works is rather than having the tires just pivot like this, they sort of move around a little bit with some, some um, a, a triangular shape, if you will. It's hard for me to explain it because I'm not really a chassis engineer. I'm just kind of fascinated by this stuff. But it does give it this unbelievably playful uh, feeling when we're talking about steering. And we'll talk about that when we drive the car. And that, to me, is really going to lead to hopefully some fun driving dynamics when we get into the canyons. The rear is a little bit more of a traditional setup, but it's got a huge beefy casting underneath there. Uh, and one thing to note as well is that when you look underneath the car, the lower control arm is totally smooth on the bottom for airflow. So again, everything optimized for range on this car and then add in as much fun driving as possible. Uh, there's three different driving modes, which I'm actually gonna show you as we open up the door here. So you guys hop in on this side and I'm gonna jump in on the other side. I'm gonna just show you the driving modes, explain the theory, explain how they work because we're gonna be talking about them a lot today. So here we are in the car. Here's the drive modes. We have smooth, swift, and sprint. Um, I don't like the names of them, but, but that doesn't really matter. One problem is the car always starts in smooth mode, no matter what you do. Swift tightens up the dampers a little bit, controls their response, steering, accelerator pedal, 
sprint mode makes you confirm that you want maximum power and torque. It's kind of annoying actually. I wish I could just leave it in max power all the time rather than every time I get in the car having to hit that button, but I guess they're trying to cover themselves. What else should I tell you about this thing? Let's jump back to the outside. So those are the driving modes. Three levels of traction control on the Lucid as well. There's on, partial, and off. Little hint because I'm actually shooting this after I drove the car. Off isn't really off in this thing. I don't know what's going on with that. You'll have to watch the video, but there's, I can't slide it. <laughs> it just grabs brakes. So I don't know if it's a software glitch or it just truly won't go off. We've seen Lucid sliding around the track, but again, this is a full customer vehicle in the hands of my friend Peter. This is not a Lucid prepped car ahead of time. Uh, it actually, I do want to touch on this software component because that, that really, I think, is a bit of a downer in this review. The big Lucid 2.0 software update that's rolling out around this time, and they've been issuing press releases and people are writing articles and I'm seeing the Lucid fans on Twitter have it on their cars, hasn't hit this thing yet. I've had it connected to Wi-Fi. I've done everything I could to get all the newest software on here. And I've waited until the last day I have this car, literally bringing it back tomorrow to California. Just doesn't have the software yet. So uh, I've asked Lucid, hey, can you get us a GT Performance? Because I'd like to drive the Performance one at some point and we'll hopefully be able to work that out where I can review all the driver assistance stuff and the performance variant, maybe with their car in the future or maybe with another viewer's car, we will see. So let's get into the video. We're gonna talk all about city, canyon, and highway driving. I wanna talk just briefly about range, 516 miles of EPA rated range. At 70 miles an hour, I got 435.5 um, on the aero wheels. Okay, that's kind of as expected and makes sense. The 21s will get less than that. So I'm thinking right around 400 miles, maybe somewhere plus or minus there. And then uh, we'll have a whole charging review coming later on as well. But just wanted to put that into context that the, the EPA range isn't really achievable if you drive 70, 80, 90 miles an hour down the highway. Just like any other electric car, we always make that distinction. Let's go drive this thing because I think you will be just as impressed as I am with the driving dynamics, and that's what really matters to me. Welcome to the inside of the Lucid Air. You join me in my town in Fort Collins where, okay, we're ready to nerd out about driving. All the stuff that, that I really love, these are my favorite videos to make because this is where I get to share my opinions of the thing I care about most, driving. And it's really one of the last videos we're shooting with the Lucid Air. I think we just have a charging video to come and maybe maybe driver assistance if it can get updated. I'll touch on that during the highway portion of this drive. Um, but ultimately, uh, this to me is where the most importance should be placed. And the reason I save this towards the end is I wanted to gather my thoughts over the last 2,500, 3,000 miles of driving this car and share those with you um, you know, it, as, as I've learned the car and all of its intricacies. But of course, I'm going to walk you through all the same in-depth driving stuff. We've done this with ID4. We've done this with Rivian. Uh, we've done this with Ionic 5, I believe, and a few other like really important cars. Do I take the time to make an hour long driving video? So the most important thing to me is going first into the settings, which I'm just going to explain to you really quick. There's a whole drive settings tab, and there's a few different ones here. In regards to regenerative braking, there's a standard and a high setting for regen. I'm pretty much going to keep the car on high regen, but I'm going to go through all of these different ones. There's also two different stop modes, which is like when you're using one pedal drive, do you want the car to come all the way to a stop and hold the car, which is how Tesla does it, which I think is best. And you can select that, or you can just select it to, to roll like a traditional manual transmission in neutral. There's also a creep function, uh, which you can turn on and off, and I'll walk you through all of these. And then there's also a stability control program where you can go on, partial, or off. So we see this in a lot of performance cars where you get like a, BMW used to call it MDM, M dynamic mode, or DTC, dynamic traction control, uh, depending on if it was an M car or not. But basically it backs off some of the stability control, lets you get a little bit of movement, uh, but keeps you right on the edge before the whole car spins and rotates. And we'll play around with those when we get to the performance section of this drive, which will be at the end of the video. Uh, the way the videos are always placed is city, uh, highway and then Canyon. Sometimes I do city Canyon highway. In this case, we're going to go city highway and then save the performance stuff for last because that's what I'm most interested in. And to me, it's sort of the make or break of the whole car. Um, 
what I'm going to do is start in the smooth drive mode. Uh, as I showed you in the beginning, there's those three drive modes, smooth, swift, and sprint. The car starts up every single time in smooth mode. And to me, that's a bit of a shame because even if I leave the car in sprint, I just want all the power all the time. Let me select it when I get in. It's a little bit annoying to have to go into the menu and then select the confirmation of sprint activation. That's how I actually really like to drive the car when I'm trying to get somewhere quickly. Unlike Tesla, that just lets you leave the Model S Plaid in Plaid mode. Um, just, just let me leave it in the high power one. Um, and unfortunately, we'll talk about it a little bit more when we get to the canyons, there's no way to separate drive mode out from steering or suspension tuning. So you have to choose their bundle. Do you want a smooth experience? Do you want a swift back road blast experience? Or do you want a rip in sprint? But I can't choose sprint acceleration with the smooth suspension and light steering, which is how I would want to drive the car every day. So that is a bit of a shame. A lot of these things can be fixed, updated, and improved upon with over-the-air software updates. Um, so at least, you know, what's most important here is, is the hardware good? That you can't fix later, but the software you can. We don't know if Lucid will or not, of course, but I hope some of their engineers watch this video and at least take in some of my feedback uh, as, as recommendation. Uh, but there's a lot that's good here. Driving the Lucid Air, if I had to sum it up to you very quickly, is uh, I think it's strong point, actually, of the whole car. And you can tell they really worked on the inputs to the vehicle, the way that it handles and moves around and transfers weight for the compromises. Again, engineering is always a compromise of cost, time frame, engineering excellence, and other things that make the whole product what it is. Um, but I think they chose pretty good compromises here given a certain things. We're gonna go into drive. I don't like the way the shifter feels. To me, this is a little bit plasticky. The turn signal's way too plasticky and I wish this was a nicer material going into drive. Okay, but I, I am glad that they still have stocks and it doesn't do this stupid thing on the screen like Model S does. Uh, one of the first tests that I'm actually gonna start doing here is, is called the rocking test. And there's technical terms for all of this, but essentially, a lot of electric motors have a hard time going backwards and then forwards, and sometimes they're clunky. So let's see how it feels just rocking back and forth into drive. And this, you can get a sense of how they feel on the motor mounts. And the first thing I'm noticing is a clunk going from reverse to drive. So it's reversing, goes dunk. I can feel a little shift. I don't know if that's the motor mount shifting or an actual electrical pulse that's being sent to the motors. But the rocking motion, I don't know if you can hear the clunks. It's pretty harsh going back to force. There's not much smoothing on there. We're not gonna keep doing it because it's a bit abusive. Um, the next component I'm sure you can hear is quite a loud motor um, NVH transfer to the cabin. Now, my understanding is that the front motor is solidly mounted. It is not mounted on isolation mounts, which means um, whenever the motor moves, does something, creates a bit of vibration, there's no isolation mounts that stop that noise from transferring and reverbing into the whole car. The rear motor, my guess, is on isolation mounts and I hear nothing from the back. All noise is from the front. Even when I put my head back, I hear nothing from the rear motor. The front is, I would say, unnecessarily loud for this type of vehicle. When we reviewed the Rivian, uh, I fell in love with the motor noise because it's a truck. It's kind of cool. It's like, let's hear what this thing's doing. This is a Lucid Air going up against Model S, going up, I think, most importantly against EQS, and even more importantly, Combustion S-Class. That's the type of level of, I guess, per engineering excellence that a Lucid buyer will be coming into, uh, you know, driving this car. And, and thankfully, I've actually just driven EQS combustion as a reference point recently. I've driven EQE, I've driven EQS, EQS AMG, Model S every day, I own one. Um, and so I have a lot of this car's competitors fresh in mind, which I think is, is sort of important as well. So from an NVH standpoint, I can instantly tell you the front motor is way too loud. We'll see how that feels throughout the drive because it does improve at higher speeds, but it's still not perfect. My recommendation to Lucid would be to mount the front motor on an isolation mount rather than trying to adapt the actual physical motor um, to being quieter. And I think that would take care of 90% of the noise that we're hearing. Um, so that, that's just my suggestion to them uh, for that. 
The other thing, let's talk about the regen low speed strategy. This car is pretty much identical to Tesla in the way that it goes about its input strategy. You can drive it in a one pedal drive mode, which is how I have it set right now. And when you come to about a mile an hour, again, they're permanent magnet motors, so they generate a magnetic field all the way down to zero. So you can use the motors to regen to really low speed, and then it'll just pull the brake pedal away from you at zero and lock on the brakes using the, the service brakes. And that's just how Tesla operates. It's very natural. Let me demonstrate for you really quick. Coming off the accelerator pedal, and we come pretty much right to a stop, no rocking, no delay for it to grab the brakes. They did a really good job with the one pedal application here. And I'm just gonna pull in this parking lot to show you as well. Um, you hear that front motor? Really loud front motor. So here we are coming to a stop. I'll just come right here. Off the pedal, full regen, coming down and boom, right to a stop and grabs the car. No fuss, no drama, as it should be. What I wanna do is change some of these drive settings. So what I'm gonna do is put the car, you have to put it in park to change, that's not uncommon. And I'm gonna put the stop mode to roll instead of the hold function. So if we go up this little alleyway here, I've never actually been over here before, but it's a perfect spot for this. We're gonna do the same test. I'm gonna lift off completely. Big regen. Regen is off at two miles an hour, one and now we're at zero and I can feel the car rolling back ever so slightly. And it's actually applying a little bit of throttle, I think, to hold the car right there, or it could be an auxiliary power load for the air conditioning unit, but definitely not, yeah, we're rolling backwards. My recommendation, and then I can put my foot on the brakes, and is there an auto hold at that point? No, so that function turns off auto hold as well. So my recommendation is to put stop mode and hold and use the wonderful one pedal driving. I mean, this is world-class one pedal experience, comes to a stop, holds it on the brake, brake lights are on, wonderful. I'm gonna put creep mode on now and see what happens. So creep enabled, the vehicle will move slowly when the brake pedal is released, disable in vehicle settings. So now it's creeping to four miles an hour is what it feels like to me. And so even if I go full lock, we're at five miles an hour. So creep targets a five mile an hour roll, maybe even more, six right now. And if I put my foot on the brakes, friction brakes are applying, comes to a stop, and it creeps again when I come off the brake pedal, back on the brakes, no auto hold with creep. So creep seems to disable all the stop mode functions here. And can I confuse creep sometimes if I'm trying to inch out somewhere? What it seems to be doing is just putting a constant load on the motors. I can hear it even with my foot on the service brake. So that's very similar to like a torque converter automatic that's trying to create a little bit of forward push on the car no matter what. That will feel the most normal to people getting in this car. But again, I don't like it. So those are the two different low speed situations. I wonder if I go roll and creep on, it shouldn't make any difference at that point. Let's try it. So creep and roll, no different actually at all. Uh, so we're gonna go hold, creep mode off, regen high. And we'll talk about the two regen settings as we get on the road. So that's how all the low speed stuff works. I think they've absolutely nailed it. Um, really nice calibration, love it. The one thing is you can hear the motor cogging and the harmonics at very low speed because there's no isolation mounts, way too much. So that's a very, the first thing when I put people in this car, they notice that they're like, wow, why is it so loud? I'm like, well, don't know what to tell you, but it needs to be quieter. And it's and it gets you know louder the harder you hit the throttle, of course, as you start driving. So we're in smooth mode, pulling out onto a road. Here we go. You'll hear that noise, and then it gets quiet around 40 miles an hour, maybe 35, 40, 45 miles an hour. That front motor tends to just you know sort of wash into the background. So we're at 85% state of charge, which is enough to get most regen, not all actually. Um, this car really regens hard at low states of charge when the battery's warm, as expected. Nothing crazy special there. Um, but at 20 miles an hour, we're coming in. You can see it actually stops very quickly. So this has more aggressive regen than Tesla. I would say almost on par with Rivian's regen, where it, when you lift off the accelerator pedal, this thing's like, vroom, stop. Love it, really, really good. Um, and I just want to try standard regen braking because I've never actually tried it in the car. Let's try it. So we're doing about 35, lifting off. Still very strong regen in standard. So they took very much a Rivian approach here 
and went with it. My preference is regen on high, stop mode on hold, creep off, and it's the most one pedal like experience here. I think they did a wonderful job. Moving on to the next topic, which is throttle application in the city, because to me this is a really important touch point of the car. How quickly can you respond to my inputs? When I put my foot down, is the thing going to move? And the answer is actually not so good right off the bat. So the car starts up in smooth mode, the key up setting as we would say, and I can put my foot down and it goes instantly when you floor it, but anything else, it takes a second for it to ramp up. It's like there's this artificial marshmallow underneath the accelerator pedal, smoothing out everything you're doing. And to me, um, that's not the point of an EV. The point of an EV is to have a wonderfully uh, calibrated throttle pedal that does exactly what I want it to do. So regen to a stop, foot on the accelerator pedal. There we go, now we get the power. Just so delayed. So, again, you can change this all with drive mode. The problem is going into swift mode or sprint mode also changes the suspension calibration and makes the car ride over bumps firmer, which is not what I want around town. So if I'm just cruising to Starbucks and back, I bought, you know, let's just say you bought this car, it's 820 horsepower, something like that, and you get maybe I don't know, 350 of it, maybe? It really feels like not much power at all at that uh, particular time. So we're just gonna let these folks cross with their cute dog, and then we'll be able to, to creep on out here. Um, so to me, smooth mode, bit of a shame. When I bump it up into swift mode, just, at, just for reference, the throttle becomes a little bit sharper, definitely quicker to react, but not test the levels of reaction at that point. And so then I ultimately end up going into sprint mode, which requires a secondary activation to put it in this mode, which I don't understand because the car drives just the same. Like it's not scary at all when you put it into this mode. It's still quite controllable. There's nothing you can do to upset the car with traction control on in sprint mode. So I would say no need for that warning. Um, there's no legal regulation because of course Tesla lets you have way more power all the time without putting in this warning, but at least it's probably trying to cover their bases. But then you get a really good throttle pedal. And as soon as you put your foot down on the pedal, it's like, ooh, instantly moves, instant regen. You floor it and it boogies and it struggles for traction. It's really nice. So I love this sprint mode throttle. To me, it feels the way an electric car should feel, which is this sort of telepathic connection between my right foot and what the car is doing. But I don't know if you can tell over these bumps and things, the car firms up pretty hard. And so you hit these bumps and you're crashing over all of these things and I don't want that. So let me separate out the drive modes, Lucid. That would solve that problem. I'm gonna put it back to smooth mode for the rest of the city thing because now we should talk about steering uh, and how it maneuvers at low speed. So I'm just gonna pull in here. Again, hate the turn signal sound. That's something I think has really come up as a topic when we've been live streaming is uh, I'm pulling into a gas station in Lucid. How about that? It's a good time to touch on steering. Um, so let's do that. That's pretty cool. Solar powered EV charging station in front of us. I've never gone to check that out. Time for another video. What's very interesting is there's pretty much a two turn lock to lock in this car, which is very similar to model three. So let me just mention one turn, one turn, the whole car moves over and does a, a full lock to lock situation. That's a very quick turning radius. Maybe it's like two and a quarter turns lock to lock because you can see I have a bit more on here, but that's a very quick turning uh, uh, circle. But what's interesting to note is with a little input like this, not much happens. So there's a ramp effect within the steering rack that when I get to about this point, really cranks over the steering rack. And to me, that's a very nice, a premium way of doing steering. And it allows for more finer uh, control at lower speed, um, you know, especially for maneuvering and, and even for higher speed going into corners and stuff. We'll see how that does in the canyons. But when you really just want to turn, you don't have to crank away at the wheel over and over. So I think that's a really nice compromise. And the steering is a total strong point on this car. Every input you make into the steering system is just rewarded with positivity, great response, um, and, and just awesome steering. What I really love is this trend towards good steering in electric cars, finally. I mean, I couldn't imagine worse steering in my Tesla with this half a steering wheel situation. Um, and I really don't like the Model S rack that much for performance driving. Maybe it'll be better when I get a round wheel on and take some bushings out of the suspension. But this is very much 
sports car level reaction and steering input even around the city but with a very light pressure on the wheel it's very light the one thing i don't personally like is the steering wheel i think the steering wheel see that's where i would want sprint mode to just rip through the light i don't have to don't want to have to go hard throttle and wait for it to go one thing i hope they do could you try again no she just, I guess my Apple Watch has recorded everything. One thing I wish they would do for Sapphire for their performance trim is to put a thinner wheel on to come out at less of an upright angle, or I should say a tilted away angle. I really like Porsche steering wheels because they come at an exactly 90 degree angle and you really get this nice feeling in your hand. When I hold a wheel, I don't want it to be uh, away from me like a bus. I want it to be upright. And there are some fatigue considerations for long distance trips, but even just working a wheel around the city, it's really, in my opinion, nice to have it mounted a little bit more upright. Um, the other thing is the steering wheel material. This is way too thick of a steering wheel for me. I like a thin wheel. I can feel all the things coming through. And there is a lot of steering feel that's coming up through here that I can feel is just being, um, you know, sort of wasted away into these uh, into this thick padded material now as a luxury cruiser let's say a, a buick of today's time if that's the design strategy they nailed it here for highway cruising the steering wheel works great but to really get a tactile sense of all the work that the chassis engineers did uh, and and the steering engineers i wish that the steering wheel was was less padded i prefer a three spoke wheel um, but visually this is very nice and no major issues here the only issue with the steering wheel i would say uh, is that these bottom lights on this bottom row don't dim at nighttime. So at nighttime, everything can go quite low. Although I will say three separate screens here, sorry, four separate screens here, um, they all actually dim at different brightnesses. So I think they need to tune the brightness levels of the screens a little bit better. That can be done through software. Maybe this can be, but for some reason, these lights on the wheel don't dim at all these bottom ones and you're just getting blinded by them. So a bit of a shame, but not doesn't seem like a hard problem. Uh, to solve. The next thing that's really important for any bit of our driving review is the seating position and the seat doesn't go low enough. So I hope that they rework their steering rails so you can get nice and low in this car rather than sitting on top of it, which is my feeling now. The other weird thing is that this, when you have the seat in the lowest position, it's, it's movement fore and aft isn't, um, isn't completely flat. It basically, the seat at certain pre-selected points throughout the uh, throughout the rails has to raise up to almost clear an obstacle underneath and then you can put it back down so anytime I move the seat back it actually raises and then slides and then I have to manually push it back down and depending on where it stops I actually can't go lower so that needs to be reworked. They need to figure out a way to get the seat lower and not have to clear obstacles. Maybe put modules somewhere else, but that's the only time I've ever experienced in the car. And I have some friends that are seating engineers and I was just talking to them about this and they're like, whoa, we have never you know, heard of doing that. And they do seats for you know huge automakers. And I'm like, well, I know, like kind of sucks. Um, so that just shows, okay, early days. And to get to the lowest seating position, it's about an inch farther back than where I would like. So, okay, needs a little bit of work there. Back to driving in the city though. This is where I think a lot of people are gonna be commuting. Very tight cabin, almost no squeaks and rattles. You do hear quite a bit of the electric motor whine, which I think could be fatiguing over time for something that you wanna have as a luxury cruising experience. And um, But the sizing of the car is right. It's a relatively big car, but it's easy to place. Amazing sight lines around. Very few blind spots on this vehicle. We're actually going by one of our uh, potential warehouse options here. I just came by to see what it was what was going on over here um, and we'll actually do a launch control out here because mm, that'd be kind of fun um, but really good viewpoints around the entire vehicle no issues at all uh, with anything related to sight lines with placing the car in a parking spot it's really nice I really I love driving this car around the city you know you'll see me get into this almost every time over my Model S if I just want to go and run a quick errand because round steering wheel makes a big difference the brake pedal you never have to use around the city if you do it's not a bad brake pedal um, and I, I just like the feeling of placing this car on the road so that's all city stuff 
way too noisy on the motor side, very quiet from the outside world making its way in, wonderful steering but could use a, maybe a different steering wheel. The throttle pedal, I much prefer to drive the car in sprint mode but give me an option to have the soft suspension and don't make me go into a separate like confirmation thing, it's not like it's scary fast in sprint mode um, in my opinion. This again is not the GT performance, maybe that would require it, this car doesn't require something special. And um, the one thing I do wanna bring up are just the cameras on this car because for, for low speed maneuvering, there is a wonderful 360 degree view camera that's all stitched together here. You can move the camera views around and they did a really nice job with the 360 degree view camera. That's been quite nice. There's also a backup camera that isn't so nice. The quality is wonderful, but it, there's um, like the frame rates behind a little bit. Sometimes if I notice the software is trying to complete another task, this will actually get a little bit um, jittery and laggy and I'm like still backing up and I'd like stop, wait for the software to catch up. These are things that can be optimized as they smooth out their software. But to me, um, that, that uh, backup camera needs to be smoothed out. There's also a zoomed in normal and zoomed out view. Um, only the normal 1x view gets the actual guidance lines, which are pretty accurate. I'm a fan of the guidance lines. So let's do a full launch control because in the city, some people like to rip around and like get to their place the fastest. I think the first thing I'll actually show you is just uh, smooth mode, flooring it from a light. No launch control unless you're in sprint. So here's smooth mode, very lax off the line doesn't give you full power till 60 miles an hour and even that feels like half of what the car can do so a bit of a shame I don't understand that strategy why you'd want to limit power for every day the reason you buy this thing is to use you know the crazy acceleration next up we're just gonna skip swift mode because it doesn't really matter we'll talk about that in the canyons let's just do a sprint mode hard throttle from a stop without launch control so it hits pretty hard but very smooth then at 60 miles an hour, it takes that entire time to reach full power. And then you're rocking from 60 to 150, allegedly. Uh, this thing buggies, it's insane. Really strong high speed performance here. And that's really not part of this review because it's not that needed. Let's just give it a quick full bean acceleration here. So there's a, there is a car coming up, but left foot hard on the brake, flooring it with the right. This little bear comes up, launch mode activated. And it freaking rips. <laughs> but the only way to get that good crazy acceleration uh, is to go sprint mode and launch mode and so I find that if I'm like trying to get cross town I'm like launch moding it every stoplight just to zip in front of everyone because that's why you buy an electric car so there you go that's how it drives in the city uh, all the smooth acceleration stuff uh, not a fan of I would much prefer to drive it in sprint and there you go, lucid air around town. What we're gonna do now, I, this is a long in-depth video, but that's how I think they need to be. We are gonna go to the highway portion next, which will be hopefully interesting to you because that's where this car is really designed. After the highway, then we're gonna go shred it in the canyons, which I'm really looking forward to. And that should be the end of the video after that. Sorry for clogging up your whole day, but I hope this is helpful information. Let's go to the highway. So now we're about to jump onto the highway in the Lucid Air, and this is where I've honestly spent the majority of my time with this car up to this point. And it's really good. The too long don't watch portion of the highway is really good, but there's a huge asterisk on that. So I'm gonna keep the car in key up setting like we discussed earlier, which is the smooth mode. It should be the most efficient, the most comfortable, because again, it backs off the dampers a little bit and overall should be just the calmest way to cruise. And that's what this car is really good at. So let's talk about getting up to speed on the highway. Smooth mode, of course, pretty long accelerator pedal. You just put in an input, keep your foot there, and then the car will waft up to speed if you like. So, um, so much to dive into on the highway because this is where this car is really designed to operate, at least in all of the marketing materials and everything like that. 516 miles of EPA rated range on this car. Uh, of course, that's if you're running the aero wheels and even then you're not gonna get that at 70 miles an hour. You'll get that at, you know, 55 miles an hour constant or something like that, but no one drives like that. Let's just say realistically 420 to 475, somewhere in that range. If you drive like a sane person, will get you, you know, you'll, you'll easily reach that range 
cruising down the highway. Now, if you have a headwind or if you drive pretty quickly, you're into the high 300s, honestly, pretty easily, I think. Um, but to get this thing to go under 300 miles on the highway, you'd really have to be stomping on it, and I don't expect that to be um, the case. Maybe in wintertime, because I haven't had a chance to test the car in cold weather, but overall, I would say, you know, north of 300 miles, without question, cruising on the highway, which is pretty impressive. So, the first thing I want to talk about is noise. Um, there is a small amount of high voltage noise, uh, whether it's motor whine or inverter whine, it's just a, a very high frequency noise that you can sense is in the background. It's not like you're floating along silently, uh, cruising along. However, it is so much better than below that 40 or 45 mile an hour cutoff around town like we discussed, where you really hear that front motor. It's, uh, it's only from the front that you hear on the highway as well. The rear, you pretty much hear nothing from. It's pretty smooth and quiet. The thing is, the aero wheels uh, that I originally had on this car were a significant improvement in quietness over the 21s we're on today. And uh, the more time I spend on the bigger wheels, the more I'm like, oh yeah, it was actually quite a bit quieter on the arrows. And I think a lot of that has to do with tire composition, a lot of that has to do with the wheel size and placement on the car. But just impact noises, things seem to transfer through on the 20 in, 21 inch more than the 19 inch wheel um, by like quite a bit. Now it wouldn't stop me from going from the big wheels, but if all you're gonna do is highway driving on this car, and that's why you're buying the Lucid for the longest possible cruising range, then go for the aero wheels. I think that's a pretty good assumption to make. In terms of ride comfort on the highway, I think they nailed it. This thing, I drove it from from Palm Springs to Colorado. I have a whole video on that. And the way that this goes about its business going down the road in terms of high speed stability, in terms of comfort, in, in that compromise where, you know, it's not an air suspension, it's a coil suspension being quite soft. I'm curious to see how that does in the canyons coming up next. But that compromise of us just wafting down the highway, it does that really well. And I think significantly better than Model S without question. It would be really interesting to drive this against EQS cruising down the highway. Their range isn't as far apart as you would think and EQS is tuned to be really soft with uh, the air suspension. Also, um, we'll get to the big point in a minute, but ugh, there's a big problem here. So in terms of tracking stability, in terms of ride comfort, in terms of, in terms of noise, um, even with this much glass in the car, really well controlled, definite cruiser, and would, you know, it would just be a joy to drive this across the country. If you're going to be doing long distance, huge mileage, this is what I would recommend going for um, over almost any other electric car. That's this car's strong suit. Is this guy pulling this Chrysler? Nice. We got the chain hooked up, pulling down I-25. <laughs> I-25 is the sketchiest place to drive where we are right now. If you want to get your car totaled, drive on this road because it's just insane. I know we mentioned that in a lot of videos, but wow, do we see some things. I had to intercept a drunk driver the other day um, with the police because I called him in. The dude was like hitting every cone in construction zones, four wheels off the road. It was totally insane. Uh, and then I got a hold of some of the troopers and we're like, all right, we're passing this exit. And then we were like ripping around and it was great. And then we all pulled him over. I felt like I did something cool. Uh, anyway, the dude went to jail. Pretty wild. Um, back to the Lucid. Highway cruising, wonderful. The one thing that isn't necessarily a driving topic that I'd like to bring up though, uh, I guess two things. The first is the sound system. In my opinion, the sound system, they, they tout this Dolby Atmos thing and you get this spatial audio. And for the mids and highs, when you listen to the built-in title streaming with a Dolby track, um, is really quite good. I really do like it. But the bass is so lacking in this car. There's no subwoofer in the back. It, I feel like maybe there is one and it's just unplugged or it's not getting signal, but it's like there's no low down big bass hit. And I get out of this and I got into the Mercedes EQE with I want to say they have a Burmester system in that car, and it was just mind-blowingly better. The Model S, much better than this car. I really think the sound system's a letdown for me. Um, now, if you're listening to classical music or more rock music, maybe then totally fine, but uh, you know, a lot of electronic music, things like that, that you really want to feel the bass, mm, total letdown on the highway. So then I just resorted to podcasts. 
there's also a lot of software glitches on this version, which I think is really, I think, impacting the review of the car. I'm trying to separate hardware and software here because software can be updated, but I do also have to mention that whenever I was going in and out of cell service, the sound system kept glitching out and it just made for a really not a good ride. Here we are on some big bumps, suspension controlling everything wonderfully, a very premium feeling suspension. The chassis guys did an amazing job on the highway. All right, so the second point that I wanna bring up other than the sound system that has to do with long distance ability is the charging in relation to the range. Lucid is all about big range, big range, big range. That's their communication. That's what they claim the car is built for. Again, you're gonna see low 400 miles at a normal person's pace down the highway. If you're driving like this, 60 miles an hour in dense traffic, you might see 500 miles in a situation like this quite easily because we're having all the other cars push the air out of the way for us. Uh, that was one point Tom brought up when he did his Lucid Air range test we talked about in the Inside EVs podcast. He said he was in a moving pack of cars, which really can impact the aerodynamics of a, of a range test. In ours, it was just the car pushing the air the whole way. Um, so, so the next point is the charging portion, which to me seems to be this car's weak link. Is that crazy? Because it's also the fastest car I've ever charged. I've seen a 350 kilowatt, 351 kilowatt peak on this car. Sounds amazing, but it hits it for like a minute and then falls on its face. So basically between like zero and 15%, you'll see 300 kilowatts. Great, but no one's gonna be running their Lucid down that low I would say a few people, including me, would do that. But it actually, you know, it does have pretty good range, so good luck getting it down there. And then as soon as you hit 50% state of charge, it's like unplug and go to the next because you're around 150 kilowatts or less by the time you're at 50%. Just for reference, Tycon, much smaller battery pack, can do 272 kilowatts at 50%. You know, pretty much double. Beers makes no difference. So I'm not sold on the charging ability of this car. Also, manual battery preconditioning, and it's very temp temperature sensitive. I'll have a whole charging video coming out after this one. You're gonna be very impressed with the charging if you'd like to keep the car down low like me, but I think most people tend to plug in at 10 or 20% state of charge, and then you're gonna not really see more than 250 kilowatts ever, um, you know, in those types of situations, and it really just falls off. Uh, does not like to sustain high power charging for a long time. It's close to 20 minutes, zero to 50%. So on a road trip, which is why you'll be spending this car, you know, spending time on the highway, I would be really curious to see how this does against the Taycan on a long trip because that has really, really high power charging, but of course is significantly less efficient. Don't know, that would play out. But if you are gonna spend time on the highway, this car rocks at it. Great stability, great comfort, great noise. That, that's what this car is optimized for. And here comes the but, the big issue with this entire car for me, software. And that really puts a downer on this whole thing. You see, today as we speak, there are Lucids in customer hands with Dream Drive, with lane centering, with all of these things. And as far as I can tell, speculation, it's just in the hands of the real Lucid hardcore fans. At least they're the ones posting about it on Twitter. Uh, and Lucid's done this whole thing and sent press releases out that's like, hey, software 2.0 is rolling out. Here's everything about it. And then all the news articles, all the websites are going, Lucid's got new software and they're fixing this and it's the biggest software update in history. Guess what? That was like last week, this car still a week later doesn't have the update. I've had it connected to Wi-Fi. I've had my mobile app on the newest software. For some reason that made a difference and the car just isn't getting updated. So as far as I'm concerned, this car has no lane centering, which makes the road tripping ability really suck. For example, I can put it on adaptive cruise control, which we're on right now. I can set it to 75 miles an hour and the adaptive cruise control portion is truly wonderful. Um, you can see that car moves out of the way. We're starting to pick up speed nice and smoothly, no harsh movements. I can get the distance really close if I want to. I'm really a big fan of this adaptive cruise control system. If I hit a line, just as an example, you'll see the wheel, it goes red and it pushes us back to the right. Great, so it knows where the lanes are. It knows that where the distance is to the car in front, but yet somehow a year after start of production, it still doesn't have lane centering, which makes the road trip ability really suck. And it's like, I don't care about the range. I don't wanna be steering this thing in a $154,000 car for hours on end when I can just stop for an extra minute at a charger or stop one more time for a few minutes 
in an EQS in a Model S, let's just say, none of these numbers are really making a huge impact on your road trip. Um, I'll just stop and charge one of those that has fully baked software as is. Now granted, to cut loose in some slack, it does sound like the rollout is happening very soon. I just haven't had a chance to evaluate the lane centering and I've waited until the last possible moment to share this review uh, of the highway driving portion because I really wanted to give them every last chance I could to talk about the lane centering ability and its driver assistance. But unfortunately, it hasn't come. Of course, at the next earliest opportunity, I'll be evaluating that in our hogback driver assistance challenge that we run up on I-70. And so that should all be coming to you soon where we really will evaluate it, but it just hasn't come to this car and we've had it for almost a month now, something like that. And it's like, all right, this thing has to go back to Peter. Very sad that, um, that it has not been updated. There's only one last negative point I'd like to bring up about the adaptive cruise control system, which I can bring up right here, which is when the driver actually takes over on the system. So for example, I have it set to 65 miles an hour, we're going slow. If I just do a quick cancel of the cruise control system, which I can do by hitting this bottom left button, when I go on the throttle, you'll see regen hit, and then it was like good, you know, one Mississippi, maybe one and a half seconds before it got my throttle application. So when you cancel uh, cruise control, I'm going down on the accelerator pedal, the car is not responding at all. And your natural reaction in very quick time is to go harder on the accelerator pedal to compensate. You're like, whoa, the car is not accelerating. And by the time the car wakes up and goes back to your pedal request, you're way too far down on the throttle and you get this jolt of acceleration. And so I really think they need to override whatever smoothing software they have here and always prioritize pedal application in real time. No, that's a little bit nerdy, but it, to me that really caught me off guard many times throughout the whole trip. And that's something that can easily be fixed through software. So to sum up the highway portion, it's a mix of good and bad. The good, unbelievable cruising ability this car is optimized for it you can tell how slippery it is there's very little drag for example if you put the car in neutral it just wants to coast forever also helpful as to why it gets so much range really really well tuned for highway stuff big regen at high speed uh, especially at lower states of charge wonderful cruiser on the flip side still no lane centering ability the adaptive cruise control is very good, but the takeover uh, combination isn't so good and no eye tracking at the moment. So it's still a hands on the wheel situation. And I haven't been able to even, well, I shouldn't say that. It does have eye tracking, but it doesn't allow for lane centering because it's not active yet. So I've turned off all of the eye tracking warnings because especially in low light scenarios, it kept thinking I wasn't watching the road, but I was. I have a whole live stream demonstrating this on our out of spec motoring channel. When I road tripped it, I was getting annoyed at all the warnings that were coming at me for not watching the road when in actuality I was. So thankfully you can just turn all that off. So highway driving, that's the strong point of this car. It really loves to cruise and waft and cover distance. So my uh, recommendation for those who I recommend this car for people to buy, which I still do to a lot of people, uh, is if you do huge road trips and you wanna stop the least amount of times, which is a lot of people, but don't expect to get the 500 miles on the highway. Um, or you have like a really long commute and like sometimes you just gotta go and do stuff and you just wanna spend the least amount of time at charging stations, that's where this car comes into play. If you're actually blasting across the country and you're trying to get there the fastest, this wouldn't be so bad, but I won I really need to run the calculations and maybe need to run a Lucid against a Tycon and see which would be the better cannonballer because that's what matters to me. It's like, I don't care how often I have to charge. I don't care really about anything else other than what's the shortest amount of time it'll take to get from A to B over a long distance. And for me, I'd much, much rather stop in and charge for 10 minutes and leave and rip to the next station as quickly as possible rather than spending an hour charging to 80% or 90% in this. Um, just my last charging session was 14 to 90% in 58 minutes. And then, you know, sort of cruising nicely to the next station. That's not how I like to road trip, but some people do. And uh, no question, this thing rocks on the highway. So here comes the big wild card for me. And this next component is what I think is actually gonna make or break the Lucid for me personally, which is how does it drive in the canyons? It's the last test. It's the final thing I'm pretty much doing with the car. 
And for me, I, I'm actually glad I saved it for last because I wanted to have opinions about everything else about the car, how it cruised, how it charged, how the software works. And then really the whole decision-making sway as to whether or not I love it or hate it truly comes down to how it drives in the canyons from a sporting setup. And I actually have an inkling that it's gonna be pretty damn good. So I'm really excited to see this. So let's go to the base of the canyons and see how this thing shreds up some of the best driving roads that I drive all the time. So we're at home, we have a, a road that I'm familiar with, we have a car that I've done you know, 3,000 miles in now. Let's see how this thing does. So we start with a hardcore acceleration. Now on the 19s, the aero wheels with an acceleration, you would just roast all four tires. It was pretty hilarious. This one, uh, based off of what we did in the city, I think should hook up pretty well. So we're at 80% state of charge roughly. Left foot hard on the brake, flooring it with the right. Launch mode activated. Seems like you can just sit here forever. Um, you'll see a picture of a bear with a racing flag. So again, the non-performance GT, but let's send it. Strong performance off the line. Full power at 55. Shreds. Harder acceleration at 80. Then there's a dip to 90, but at triple digits, good. Full brakes. Uh, funny, it peaks the traction control light when it goes into ABS. And very strong braking performance and strong acceleration performance. Definitely a lot more grip here on their 21 inch wheel package from their 19. I'm gonna put it in swift mode, which is the middle mode, and it basically shows the car on a twisty road, and that's where we are right now. So let's not 10 tenths it, but let's just kind of hustle it down a road and see how it feels. Steering, wonderful. Pedal response, very good at speed, actually, unlike the city. I can feel we're already at the limit of the front tire there, and it as I apply more throttle, it is not giving me nearly as much power as we just had. So that's a little bit annoying. We need to be a little bit mindful of other road users today. It's the last, one of the last beautiful days before winter. So that's why I have us in swift mode down here at the bottom of the mountain. But let's start breaking it down. First of all, using a lot of brake pedal coming into these corners and I'm liking the brake pedal feel. It's soft, but it's easy to modulate. And I like how the car kind of leans up on the front axle. It's a really nice control pitch and dive um, in this car. Even though it's quite soft, Again, only having the active damper component with a steel spring designed for highway cruising, as we found out on the highway, I think they took a really good compromise. Even here in swift mode, if I floor it, it just doesn't give enough power. It's like we need need this sprint mode, and I think, honestly, we may just end up keeping it in sprint mode. Um, but I can hear traction control cutting in around corners and stuff when you're a bit too aggressive with it. But if you're just smooth on the throttle and lean it in, you are pretty much good to go. I can feel the driver aids coming in, so I'm just going to turn off lane departure protection. And what else should I turn off? Drive off alert, blind spot, we'll leave on. So just turned off all the lane stuff and... I think that's pretty much all we need to disable. Will this guy pull for us? Yes, he will. Thank you so much, appreciate that. Hazards are up here in the roof, so we'll thank him for his service today. And we are back to full power in Swift. Now what's interesting, in smooth mode, it uses a lot of front motor around town. Here I can really feel the rear motor helping quite a bit. Into a corner, traction control flashing away. Brakes make quite a weird noise when ESP first cuts in. You hear that <laughs> And so, yeah, like, Okay, just feels a bit like too much stability control going in and we haven't even reached the max limit of the tire. So their brake booster is building pressure and it's a loud uh, pressure building, I would say, compared to other automakers. Honda's pulling for us today too. What a day it is. Big thank you to you. Um, what I'm gonna do is just put the car in sprint mode because I think that's the way to drive it. Uh, also, I've been told by Lucid engineers that the GT performance should have a little bit better thermal longevity of the system. But now we have the power that I'm looking for. So this is so much better than before. Really love the ability to place the car on the road. Coming out of a corner gives us full power as we unwind the wheel a little bit. We can play around with the traction control settings as we drive it harder. But going up a back road, yes! This is what I've been looking for. We only have a 245 front section tire, 265 rear. So not much tire on this thing. And you can hear it you know, basically <laughs> reaching the limit of front tire grip, ESP just grabbing brakes like crazy. And then um, I'm going harder throttle, harder throttle, because what I'm trying to do is rotate the car 
on power to get me out of a corner. And what's happening is it's like, oh, ESP's on, I'm not giving you any more power. This is an ESP full on. We'll have to see how partial does. And as soon as I unwind the wheel, it's like, bam, boom, and we go. And this is very similar to like a G-Wagon almost does this kind of behavior. And I can hear it just building pressure in the brake booster every time I stuff it into a corner. And I'm not even driving it that hard. I mean, we're going the speed limit, if not even a little bit more allegedly. Great performance and acceleration. You really don't need much more power than this, in my opinion. There is a noticeable dip at 80 miles an hour. Ionic 5, very nice. And that's a, a limited one too, because it had the painted arches. What I'd like to do is back the stability control off. So I'm gonna go vehicle, drive settings, lucid stability control to partial. If you wanna go off, you actually have to put the car in park. And so now we have some lights up on the dash indicating less uh, driver assistance help. So we come into a tight section here, big power, brakes, okay. A little bit too much emergency braking, I would say. And so now I'm feeling much better control over the car, yes. Yes, much less building pressure with the ESP, giving me power when I want it. Wow, really good fun through here. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Wow, that's what we're looking for. So if you're driving it hard, you gotta go sprint mode and you gotta go lucid stability control to partial. It's still not giving me anything. I can still feel it giving me more power when I unwind the wheel but so much better controlled. Also, this car really rewards smooth inputs because there's no you know, roll stabilization. So in Taycan, for example, they have something called PDCC, Porsche Dynamic Chassis Control. You can also get torque vectoring in that car. This doesn't have any of the fancy performance stuff on it. You can argue about whether that should be included for the price, but it just adds engineering time to all of these components. And so the car leans over in this, and because it's quite a heavy car, I think it's 500 pounds heavier than Model S, you feel the weight, um, but it certainly leans. Once you get a set though, then you can dig into the set and really wind this thing out coming out of a corner. So we got a guy moving with his side-by-side -side into his driveway, very nice. We'll just kind of scooch right around you, thank you very much. Big power, maybe not giving us as much power as we once had, but eh, it, it could be thermaling somewhere. We'll have to play around with it as we climb the rest of the hill. Just keeping it pinned through here. Wow, it sounds really good. I'm not gonna show you the speedometer there, but it's not a plaid. You know, you can get the faster version and certainly there's a little bit more room for that. You can see some bikers off in the distance. Go around you nice and gently. Nothing to see here, sir. Um, really, really good compromise here, I would say. I'm not sure, I haven't driven a GT Performance. I'd like to. I wonder if that's worth 30 grand more for the acceleration. Maybe it's 20 grand more. Um, and they also have some motor changes, I think, to that car as well. I'm not totally sure on all the differences, but they basically said like that car is optimized much more for this type of stuff than this car. Uh, but I, I'm actually really pleased with this car. It's very soft, and uh, but, but controlled. It's very old school German, I would say. You just pound it down a straightaway. And the brakes grab pretty hard at high speed too. So I'm very pleased with that. And the, the way this thing pulls up top is very impressive considering it's not the performance one. A lot of EVs kind of fall on their face at about 80, 85 miles an hour. This has a noticeable dip, but it's still like, whoa, pretty freaking awesome, I would say, around there. Here we come through a nice flowing section. Sprint mode for sure is the mode to drive the car in. Just keeps everything a little bit more in check. I really like, really like the sizing of the car for this type of driving. Look at this, just gentle inputs through here, covering some pretty good distance, I would say. You can hear just a little bit of tread shaw coming from the tires. We would not be able to go through there even at that speed on the 19s. So if you're gonna do any kind of performance driving, I highly recommend getting the 21-inch uh, wheel and tire package directly from Lucid. You just actually widen the track of the overall car because the 19s have a really weird offset where they sit inside the wheel well for aero, of course. And um, yeah, the noise here is very pleasant. Everything feels very nicely tuned. Go for the big wheels and just, just thrilled. Let's see if the launch control feels any slower now that we've kind of pounded it up the hill. Still pretty good regen. Haven't smelled any brakes yet, that's good, but we're on the uphill. Uh, we are not doing any launch control because you have to go stability control in full for launch control. Yeah, there we go, now launch control. Mm, not everything it had at the beginning, but close to it. 
close to it. Back to partial um, stability control now. I think I remember watching Ben Collins when he was doing the Goodwood stuff, fiddling around down here. And that's because he wanted to do a launch control and have stability control, either in partial or full off. But here we go, hammering up the hill, coming in, under braking, just nice gentle brakes. Regen comes pretty quick in sprint mode, which I like. You don't have to really wait for it to dial up. Very nicely controlled. Let's pound it through here. Full limit braking, full limit handling. Big bump through here. Yes, controlled nicely. Absolutely sending it. Full brakes. Wish we had a little bit more braking traction through here. Best section of the road. Coming up top of the hill. And full throttle. Give me power. Come on. So, how does it drive quickly? Well, I would say quite nicely. 100%. Uh, so, I really, really like the way that the car is controlled. It's heavy, you can really feel it certainly during the braking zones when you get it into a tight corner like this, though it's definitely front tire limited initially. I really wish you could put a fatter front tire on from the factory, Sapphire should solve that. I imagine maybe GT Performance as well, I'm not sure in the sizing of that, but 245 front section tire, that's just a physical limitation. There's not much you can really do about that. So if I hit disable stability control, oh, you don't need to be in park. I don't know why I thought you did. So now we have traction control full off basically, which is really nice. Traffic looks to be pretty clear, so let's send it up. Again, sprint mode, traction control fully off now. Good power, I can hear the cooling fans on. Front tire limited grip. Can we get some power on oversteer on the way out of this corner? That's gonna be the good thing. Really like the, no. Even with ESP fully off, it limits power based off of steering wheel angle, it seems. So let's try and just huck it into this corner. Big power. Nope. Even with ESP off, I don't know if you can see that. Traction control was getting on. So no chance for oversteer here. Yeah, I'm trying. <laughs> Look, full in, beans. Won't let me get any bit. It just cuts power and then goes. So, mmm. When you drive it 10 tenths, it's like got the software there stopping you. Because I can tell the car wants to do it. It wants to just hang the tail out and be on full sendy send mode. Maybe the dream performance, because we saw Jason Camisa drifting it around the track, right? Maybe the GT performance certainly should allow for that. But not convinced here. If, you know, why not let this car do it too? I know it doesn't have the P in the name, but it just seems like such a solid package that it should allow should allow me to, when it says off, lucid stability control off, it also says recommended for most driving conditions underneath, which doesn't seem right. Um, if I go back to full, partial, yeah, so I, I think that message just stays there, but I definitely was was fully off. Um, doesn't, doesn't allow me to, uh, doesn't allow me to slide it, so that's kind of a bummer. I think, uh, I actually, what I'm gonna do is actually power cycle it, make sure, because sometimes the software glitches, I just want to make sure it doesn't think I was in partial mode instead of full off through there because it felt very similar to partial stability control to me. So perhaps we should do that, try it one more time and just double check that. Let's go do that. Just coming down the hill now, I thought it'd be interesting to show you. Coming in under braking, what's interesting is as I lean the car over, there's no regen. And then as the wheel comes back straight, it does more regen. So it does regen uh, decreasing by G-force, very similar to BMW i3 and some others. And that's really to, to really control vehicle yaw. So it leaves it to the service brakes because it can't um, uh, laterally control braking force with regen with only two motors. If it had three motors, it could do reverse torque vectoring. Well, it's still torque vectoring, but regen torque vectoring. Um, so now I, I've made sure stability control was full off. I stopped the car, did the whole thing make sure we're all good here let's just back it into this dude's driveway u-turn mode doesn't even let you get any spin action what so i think it, it is just the way it is i don't know if you heard that a wheel spun and then it just cut right back so look loaded up full power nothing so why does it have a little warning for even sprint mode even when you put in traction control off you can't slide the car <laughs> i want power on oversteer Oh, well, okay, so it's a good 7 tenths back road blaster. So if you live up in the mountains of California, if you live up here, 
you can really get home quite quickly, but it doesn't love to be just sent and shredded hard throughout the whole experience. So let's sum up the Lucid Air Canyon driving review, and then we'll, we'll sum up the full experience later on. Um, for performance driving, it is miles ahead of chass with chassis control when compared to Tesla Model S. It just feels like the next generation. The steering is a wonderful strong point. That to me is the biggest takeaway here is I love the control of the car coming in and around corners. The tire selection is very much, like I mentioned earlier, everything's a compromise, is very much a compromise between range and grip. For a 245 tire moving around a car that's heavy, I'm surprised it has that much grip. And it's not that warm up here. So it's not like it's a hot sticky day. It's 56 degrees up here. So the tire is having to work hard. Um, I wish we could go for a square setup on this. The 19s are actually 245s front and rear, and I really like the balance of that, but just had no traction. So like on the arrow wheels, when I'd throw it into a corner, it's just like and ESP would be freaking out. Um, this is definitely set up more for what the car should be able to be capable of. Uh, in terms of powertrain, very pleased. I can feel it cutting back due to heat probably in some cases. I mean, we burned 20% state of charge in like 20 minutes or 15 minutes, something like that. So, you know, sent it up here, but also put a lot of regen back in the system. And because we, you know, utilizing as much regen as possible when driving an electric car hard is very important. So overall, um, that's this car's strong suit. It is uh, better than expected, actually, for having a coil suspension with damper. It's soft. You, you have to drive it like a luxury car, but just to get it into a corner, feel it lean over, it's really nice. Um, here are some things I really wish for the price that this had. First of all, for this price, I wish the performance one was 154. Uh, that would fall more in line with what I would be expecting. Um, secondly, I wish that uh, it had uh, torque vectoring on the rear axle, either with a clutch-based system or with a, two electric motors on the back. Sapphire will have that, so that seems to solve that problem, but that's $250,000. Not sure the, the values coming into play there, because again, I don't base cars' values off of numbers on paper. It's all about how they feel to me, and I'm not sure this is a $154,000 driving experience out of this car. Um, the next would be uh, some sort of chassis control or air component or roll st stabilization um, just just with this. Uh, there's technology on the market to allow the car not to fall over on its side. And I like a soft car personally. I like weight transfer and letting our car move. And those who tune those systems properly don't go overboard. You know, like Mercedes active body control used to lean into a corner. That always felt a bit unnatural to me. And I think they've backed off of that theory where they allow the car to roll a little bit, but still control the motions. And where it's most important is in quick left, right scenarios where this car struggles with because you have a lot of weight moving around. Um, and then lastly would be the, the stability control program. It, even though it says off, it's very clearly not off. Um, and, and for someone like me, and I think a lot of people that would be buying a Lucid, um, you know, driving performance is why I would want this car. So for me, I would really consider the performance one rather than the GT non-performance, but I really hope when I drive the GT Performance, I'm sure I'll have a go at some point, that off means off, and it'll really let me slide the thing, because that's really a shame. Um, th this car's set up well enough where you should be able to go full off. Uh, I really like the brake pedal feel. I like the ABS feedback into the pedal, really good pedal. I don't like the ESP booster, so the brake emergency booster response is very loud and a bit crunchy and feels like a low volume production unit to me, or it's just not isolated or insulated very well. The noises aren't very premium coming out of that. You shouldn't, when you freak out in a corner, hear all this, uh, 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 this buzzing, these weird cracks that the car is making. I think it takes away from the feeling of safety and, and surety. When you when you have an issue in a Mercedes, you hear it uh, uh, grab brakes and it's a very precise, very um, tactile response and then done with it. This is quite louder. Uh, overall, I think the seats, certainly that you can adjust the, the side bolstering to hold you a little bit tighter. They're fine. They're not a performance seat. This is meant to be the long distance highway cruiser. And I think they're more than adequate at doing the job at hand. Um, overall, the, you can tell they spent more time on the performance driving dynamic side of this car than most people will use it for. But then at the same time, if they're going to spend the time on this kind of stuff, 
give me that last 10%. And maybe that's what the performance version gives me. Um, I also have to say a huge thank you to Lucid for sending out these 21 inch wheels because I was originally planning on making the driving review on the 19 inch aero wheels um, from Peter. That's This car comes from a viewer. He had the aero wheels and Lucid, I, I talked to them too. And they're like, we see you're doing your videos. And I'm like, yep, I really need the big wheels because this thing has no grip on the 19s. It's meant for range. And they're like, yeah, we know we'll send you a set of 20 ones out and so a huge thanks to them for making this review I would say possible and a lot more um yeah, you just hit reach limit a front tire very quickly. I would say a lot more accurate to what the car is capable of, and it's really good. Certainly more agile than EQS, even with that rear steering, this is a far better car with performance, uh, better than uh, Model S. In terms of Taycan, to me, I could be a lot faster in Taycan than this particular variant. But again, I'm, I'm comparing high trim Taycan to this range spec Lucid. Really, the ultimate battle would be GT Performance against Taycan Turbo, let's just say, or Taycan GTS, um, where that, that Lucid might have more outright acceleration, but the Taycan might have a little bit better uh, in the corners. Also, the Taycan feels a bit narrower to me than this car, even though it's quite a wide car. I don't know that to be true, just my feeling. Um, this has a much more expansive cabin. That's a very small cabin. So there you have it, in the canyons, that's where this car you can tell was optimized for with this wheel and tire setup. Very pleased, huge props to the chassis guys for I would say working magic with the um, uh, passive suspension system, you know, without you know having that active damper component only I should say. Really a wonderful uh, calibration for this type of driving. The car really loves sprint mode, ESP as off as it'll go, and like a good 7 tenths cruise. It doesn't love to be shredded, but it likes this type of driving where I'm just kind of wafting with the car, letting it move a little bit, but taking nice steering inputs and just leaving a set, get the car over, and then you can just kind of control your speed with the one pedal. It doesn't love to be full ABS braked into a corner, sent into it. Uh, this car requires a little bit of a delicate touch. And that's the case for most luxury sedans. But wow, is it a high quality driving experience um, when we get into this type of stuff. So very pleased here with the Canyon thing. Actually, I was getting a little bit nervous because I'm like, oh, if this thing's not good from a performance Canyon standpoint, like I don't really know what the appeal, the appeal would be to me. Um, but thankfully it is very good here and uh, could, couldn't, be, couldn't be happier given the compromise. Also, with kind of the expectation that the GT performance would be the one that's a little bit better suited for this stuff. So let's go wrap up the video at the end, uh, or I should say, let's go to the end, wrap up the video. I know it's a long one. Hopefully it helps uh, quantify how this thing drives a little bit. And uh, there you have it. Very pleased here. You can hear the cooling fans though. So we definitely got stuff hot. So there you have it. Back home now after driving the Lucid Air all day and for the last little bit. And uh, what does it come down to? What's the summary of, again, this is just the driving portion. Well, I think it's always a compromise when it comes to engineering. This car needed max range. It needed really good NVH and it needed to be really comfortable because that's what the majority of buyers were doing with it. But then there's also this sense of playfulness. There's this little rowdy underside here where like when you take it up a back road, it's like, wow, really good. And certainly um, I think the best steering in the business um, and, and the rest of the chassis like isn't bad considering all the other stuff they had to do. So I'm really impressed with, with what Lucid had to do to create this really broad breadth of capability across many different, um, you know, sort of platforms of driving when it, whether it's city driving or cruising or hardcore driving and, um, pretty impressed overall. I think this is the car's strong point. The driving is good, but if you're not like really into driving and you're just like a tech person looking at a car, that's where this thing starts to fall apart because the software is still early days. But if you're like me and like really value a good driving experience, but also want something comfortable to drive every day, yeah, this is right on the money when it comes to stuff like that. I'm really looking forward to driving the performance variant, but um, pleased here. I, again, I told you all the things I thought Lucid can improve. Noise from the front motor, um, some material choices in the steering wheel, of course. Turning traction control off when you say it's off. Be honest. <laughs> you know, let it go full off. And, and little things like that. But overall... Yeah, nice work, Lucid. Really nice work. Glad I've been able to spend some time with it. A huge thanks to Peter for loaning us his car. And um, we'll see you on another episode soon. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.